interested in taking ballet, it's never too late. If you have an interest in dance, just do it. Don't let anybody tell you no. Hey dancers, welcome to the show. I'm Julie and I'm your host today on this episode of Broche Banter. I both own and teach at Broche Ballet, a virtual ballet school just for adults. Join us as we explore all things adult ballet. If you're enjoying these stories of the wonderful adult dancers in our community, please help us keep the podcast going by sharing your story. I'd love to have you as a guest on the show. Even if you've just started ballet, only recently returned to the bar, or just have always loved ballet, please send us an email at hello at brocheballet.com to be our next featured dancer. Today on the show, we have Casey, a late starter who has found her place in the dance world as a ballet dancer, a teacher formerly with us at Broche, and an aerial performer. Listen to her story of how she got her start, forged her path, and pushed through her insecurities to become the beautiful butterfly that she is today. Enjoy! So, Casey, um, for those of you who don't know you, Casey um, was with our Birch Ballet team here in Denver for almost the whole time that we were open in Denver. Um, uh, Started dancing with us very, very early on in the process, like just maybe four or so months after we opened. Um, Became a teacher at our studio, um, taught dozens and dozens of dancers ballet from the very beginning. Um, all the way up through their first pirouettes, um, and is also an aerial dancer as well, which is super exciting and fun to see all of that get combined. So that's just a little background about how I know Casey and how far back our relationship goes. So um, where did it start, Casey? How, how did you get in? How did you start ballet? What, what happened? So I was in my late teens, around probably 17 years old, something like that. And um, had always had an interest in dance, but had never fully pursued that. I had done theater, I had done music, piano, I art. I'd kind of done all of it except for dance. And um, tried it late in high school and absolutely fell in love with it. Nothing gave me the joy that dance did. And eventually my parents were like, all right, you're going to have to pick <laughs> which thing you want to do. And um, so I said dance. I actually started out primarily as an Irish step dancer. Um, I did that for, gosh, probably four years or so. Um, And then as soon as I fell in love with that, decided to dabble in some other forms of dance, primarily ballet and contemporary. And um, I would say probably in college was when my love for ballet really started blossoming a little bit more than any of the others. I had an incredible ballet instructor in college um, that was also a Pilates instructor. So she was also who got me into Pilates initially. Um, But she was the first ballet teacher I ever had that explained things that finally made sense. And, you know, she knew I was a late starter because a lot of people in the class had been dancing since they were little. Um, So I felt like really anxious and nervous in that class, but it was one of the first ballet classes that I ever felt like some I did well and that something made sense and then post-college started delving into ballet a little bit more and had a amazing instructor who was trained in the Vaganova uh, method shortly before I moved uh, to Denver she was also amazing she was really the one that helped me get fairly strong on point um, and then I'd fallen in love with ballet so much and upon moving to Colorado um, I knew that this was something that I had to continue. So just was doing some research. I took a couple classes, a couple places locally in Denver. And they were, they were good, they were all right, but I kind of missed that smaller intimacy, one-on-one attention in classes like I had with my ballet instructor, Sarah. And um, I found Brooch online when I was Googling um, about ballet and I, um, Send an email out. Little did I know it was you. You responded to me and said, hey, let's meet for coffee. And so we met for coffee, and I felt like I met a kindred spirit and was just like, yes, this sounds exactly like what I'm looking for. And then after that, I'm pretty sure I just jumped right in. I took classes with you for a couple months, I think, like in October, I think it was. And then took classes with you through January or February, and it was in February that – you brought me in Kristen and Jackie on staff. 
what a story. Uh, you've, you see, you've done so many different styles of dance. Um, when did, when did Ariel come into the picture and maybe just give the, the listeners a little brief overview of what Ariel is in case they're not familiar with it. So Ariel Arts, or also known as Ariel Dance, is a, um, is a branch off of circus arts. Um, and it's where you have multiple apparatuses hanging from the ceiling. Uh, some common ones people probably have either seen or heard of are the silks, which are the long fabrics that hang, or the lira, which is the big hoop, um, or the trapeze, the swinging trapeze. Those are probably the three most popular that people would know about, but I actually started doing aerial in Richmond less than a year before I moved to Colorado. Oh. Um, had always been interested in it when I was researching more um, types of dance out there. I was in a dance production um, with one of the places I taught dance at in Richmond, and they incorporated some aerial in it. And I remember seeing it being like, oh my gosh, that looks amazing. It looks like you can dance in the air and fly at the same time. All things I've ever wanted to do. So I finally got the courage one day to sign up for a class. And it was very much like my first Irish step dance class was. It was like, okay, this is, this is a thing. This is going to be a thing. Um, so I went for my first aerial training a couple months, ironically, after I started, because I loved it so much in New York City. Um, got my first aerial certification and then taught in Richmond for about six months until I moved to Denver. And Denver's circus aerial scene is much bigger than Richmond's uh, was. So I was able to start taking classes more seriously, I would say, here a couple, probably again in October, around the time I found Brooch. Um, I started branching out into other circus apparatuses and continued to fall more in love with it. And a year or two later, took another aerial training at Castle Rock, um, which um, gave me more credentials and uh, helped me a little bit more on my journey, both as a um, performer and as an instructor. And um, one thing I love about Ariel is it's a really great um, cross training for ballet because ballet is so much legs. Ariel was mostly upper body. Yeah. <laughs> you do a little bit with the legs, but it was a great way to stay in like overall shape. And mm -hmm. um, Ariel also really helped my core and made my core super strong, which helped me with balances and turns in ballet. And um, having taken ballet, um, it um, showed up in my aerial in terms of my lines um, and made the lines look a lot prettier and the toes nice and pointed. Because they want that in aerial too. They want those pointed toes. They still want them. <laughs> <Got it. laughs> I have so many. I have so many more. I have so many follow-up questions for you, Casey. Where to even start? So. Um, okay, so you started with Irish step dancing in your teenage years. Then at some point you got into ballet, just really got deep into ballet. Was this all in Richmond that this was all happening? Mm -hmm. Initially, yes. Yes. And then in college as well. Did you, did you study dance in college or did you have the ability to get a minor? What, what was the nature of that? How did that come about? So I um, decided that I really wanted to continue dance into college and wanted um, a way to keep dancing. So I ended up minoring in dance. Um, I got a dance minor. Um, I was an English major. Looking back now, I kind of wish I had majored in dance and minored <laughs> in creative writing, but you know, close enough. Um, well, but now you kind of do that. I mean, now in your life, you kind of have managed to flip that where you major in dance and minor in creative writing. It's like, well, I'm doing a lot with the minor, not a lot with the major right now, but you know, that could change. Um, but um, the dance minor was incredible. And honestly gave me the courage and the motivation and the skill set to even explore teaching dance. Um, I, as a minor, um, I didn't get all of the classes that majors have, but I was able to take both contemporary and ballet technique, um, mm -hmm. at least one of them each semester. I got to do dance history. I also got invited to join a special choreography class that was supposed to be just for majors. Um, but the dance director gave me an override and let me into that class, which was really special and kind of gave me my love for choreography, which I've really been enjoying exploring in the last couple of years and hope to continue to explore more going forward. Um, and was also able to do some improvisation classes, which helped me get more comfortable just moving without any um, 
specific combinations, which for me was always very challenging. I was like, tell me what to do and I'll do it. Right. <laughs> um, but because of that class, I love freestyling now. I love both. I like enjoy both. Um, and the, the cherry on top of all of that for me was at the end of my college career. Um, I had four credits left. I'd finished all of my English credits. So I had four dance credits left. And the dance department was doing a four-week dance intensive in London uh, the summer that the Olympics were over there. And well, that's um, awesome. <laughs> the dance director uh, came to me and said, hey, I know you've been to London before, having studied abroad. We're going to be in this similar neighborhood. Um, I know you have four credits left. You want to come along. Again, I was the only minor on the trip and felt incredibly honored. Um, so I got to do both ballet and contemporary um, at some incredible venues in London and some incredible teachers, pretty much dancing nonstop for four weeks. It was just the most incredible experience. And um, after that was kind of what gave me the real feeling that, yeah, this, I want this to not only be a part of my life, but I would love to work in some way to be able to share dance and um, had no idea what that was going to look like. Um, but after college, I was able to find a studio that let me teach some dance to some kids and um, to some teenagers specifically that had never done dance before. Like they had always wanted, and I taught them ballet. Um, so I think that was initially what gave me my love for sharing dance with people that were late starters like myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and the um, director of the dance studio said, Casey, I know you also started ballet when you were later around these girls age. I feel like you'd be the perfect fit to teach this class and felt very scared, very nervous, was like, oh my gosh, like how can I be their first ballet teacher? I feel like I still don't know half of what I should know. Um, my pirouettes aren't perfect yet, all of those things. Um, but teaching that class was such a incredible experience and several of the girls went on to continue ballet and are still doing it and are doing really well. And just knowing that I was able to just give them that little spark, if anything, and then they were able to go on to train with teachers that were more advanced, um, that got them started on their journey, and that was really special. And you also have uh, a lot of experience with performing as well, and actually modeling too, right? So you've found so many different ways to have dance involved in your life. How, how did you get involved with performing and modeling? Performing started back in Richmond. Um, I did perform with that um, dance studio that um, I was a part of. But the, also, they had another branch that was primarily a theater branch. So they would put on these big productions every around Christmas time every year that they had like 18 shows. It was something crazy like that. They had a big cast, all adults, youth, kids, everything, um, auditions, all of that. And... Um, I, I had been in theater for several years. I did the, I started getting into theater when I was, I think like 10, wow. around 10 years old. So I did theater or performed in a lot of theater productions, most of middle school and high school. So I had had the experience of performing in that way. Um, but performing with dance for the first time in college was a little different. Um, because with theater, I felt like I could hide behind the character. I wasn't Casey Pottle. I could become another character, and no one had to know it was me. <laughs> um, but with dance, I felt a little bit more vulnerable and more exposed and had to be very inten intentive with my movement to communicate what I was saying. Whereas with theater, you have lines, and that's a little bit easier to communicate what you're saying in that way. Um, but after my first dance performance, I just loved like the energy that I felt in my body getting to perform in front of an audience and realized that it was a whole different type of performing, but also felt very similar. Um, and once I got deeper into Irish step dance, um, they had lots of competitions that you would do as well as festivals that you would perform at around St. Patrick's Day. So I started doing some of those and... Um, I still question how I did some of the competitions that I did. Like later on, I ended up stopping competing because it wasn't where my heart was. It wasn't where I wanted to go. 
Um, I really value those experiences. I think they gave me a lot of confidence. Um, but I realized that I loved dance because I loved it mm -hmm. and wanted to do it because I enjoyed it and wanted it to become more of a special um, thing for me rather than kind of a love, develop a love hate relationship with it in terms right. of the competition aspect. So it's funny that you say that dance was more of like more of a vulnerable experience than performing in theater where um, myself and a couple others have, have talked about where anything where we have to use our voice actually feels more scary than if we're just performing <laughs> in dance. Um, so you, so it makes sense though, knowing how, um, how expressive you are as a teacher with your voice, that makes a lot of sense that you first found love in performing with, with your voice and not with your dance. That, that's very interesting to put that together. Mm -hmm. For sure. No, it, it's, it was funny to me. Like a lot of, I was very, very shy when I was young. And so a lot of people, when they heard that I did theater were like, wait, what, wouldn't you be really scared of that? <laughs> and I was, I always got butterflies, but I always loved playing pretend and make believe as a kid. Mm -hmm. So just pretending that I was somebody else for some reason just came easy to me then. Um, but with dance, I felt more like I was showing up as myself and using my body to express um, and having dealt with an eating disorder for a long time as a teenager, using and expressing with my body was a very difficult thing for me to do. So in a lot of ways, dance actually helped me relearn how to use my body and how to actually speak with it in potentially a more powerful way than I would have known or learned otherwise. So kind of instead of hiding and suppressing your body and, and kind of, you know, detaching from your body, you were forced to really connect with your body and use that to say my body is good enough to share with the world. Exactly. And it was a long journey. Like I look back to my first dance performances and old videos and just see how timid I was and how the movements were so little and so small. And then I revisit some performances from last year and it's just incredible to just see the confidence that I've grown in over the years and how dance has continued to be not only therapy, but has been a part of my self growth as a human being and has continued as I continue to progress to the next level of my technique. I feel like my character and my confidence in myself has gone with that and that has been a challenging but incredibly rewarding journey that I'm still on and hope to be on the rest of my life. <laughs> well it's funny you mentioned um, in the beginning um, that some of these experiences gave you confidence and that in the beginning you were a little bit anxious about going to these experiences and from, from where I know you now I don't I can't picture you at a time when you didn't have confidence like you're just so you just have such a presence when you walk into a room. So tell me about the beginning stages. Like what, did, what were you worried about? What, what, can you remember some of the things that made you nervous in the beginning? I think a lot of what made me nervous in the beginning is early on when I started performing dance, I was in groups of um, kids that were a little bit younger than me. So for example, I was in like the school that I was in um, had adult classes that were very beginner and then they had some youth classes that were a little bit more advanced and I was really kind of in the middle of the two um, but closer in age to I was in college at the time so I was closer in age to the high schoolers yeah. than the adults that were in their 30s or 40s but a lot of these kids had been dancing since they were young and so for me um, rather than looking at looking at it as a compliment that I was being put in a slightly more advanced class, I saw it as I'm not as good as these other dancers. What am I doing up on this stage? And um, so I think that aspect of feeling just insecure in my own abilities. And then also I was slowly coming out of my um, eating disorder at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was a, combination of still not quite feeling comfortable in my own body and as a result not trusting it to do what it 
probably already knew how to do um, and let my brain get in the way of my body at that time. Yeah, that's a lot of conflating factors. And for a young, a young woman, that's a lot to, <laughs> it's a lot to handle for any age, but especially someone who's in, in their youth and kind of still trying to discover who they are. Um, now, I want to get into some of your experiences with performing, because I know that's a huge, for, for many of our, our listeners and in our community, performing is a really big deal and really exciting. I mean, for some, the idea of performing just makes them want to go crawl out of the blankets. But for many, they really want to be a part of performing. And you, Casey, have had so many performing opportunities. You performed for a while there. The Earlier this year, you, you had multiple shows every single week. So how... how did that how did you how did you make that happen what what do you what do you do how do you make this how do you go about finding these opportunities and, and really uh taking taking the reins so that is a really good question um a lot of them um honestly early on fell into my lap i was given i was part of communities that wanted to give people opportunities to perform and um so I was able to then take advantage of that um, back in Virginia. When I moved here to Colorado, um, a lot of the aerial studios I was involved with did yearly either student showcases or specialty shows. And um, so I was like, okay, I've performed with dance before. Performing in the air, that's a whole new thing. <laughs> so I signed up to do a student showcase one year, um, even though I was um, – teaching at the time still. Um, I had taught Ariel for about a year, but I had never performed with it. It was another thing where it went back to when I first started dance, was like, okay, comfortable doing this in class and in the studio, but in mm -hmm. front of people, oh, what? Um, and again, it was one of those experiences where I just felt so empowered being on that stage. And um, a lot of people saw me perform and um, said, you have real potential. Um, and we would recommend you continue to train at these venues and that you consider being in our like big performance at the end of the year, which was different than a student showcase. It was a performance you had to actually audition for. Most of the student showcases, they would just, you know, you create your little piece and you get to go do it. Yeah. Um, so I auditioned for a, um, big aerial show and, uh, got in and got to be part of like a big group of, um, uh, dancers on fabric, which was really, really fun and, um, continued, um, networking is huge. Mm -hmm. Um, networking is also not something that is my strong suit, believe it or not. I had to learn how to do it and had to learn how to ask and um, I just continued to take classes at various studios, make friends with various other instructors and coworkers. And um, I eventually met um, the owner of um, Denver Dance, which is an aerial dance studio here in Denver, um, Marguerite Ensley. And she um, runs a special aerial late night show at the clock tower cabaret which is a very popular venue in downtown denver for those of you that live in colorado apparently people even out of colorado know it it's a pretty famous venue but one day she had taken a couple of my sling classes which i was like so like intimate i was like marguerite's in my sling class she's like <laughs> one of my aerial idols she's incredible and she comes up to me after about a month of taking some of my classes and she said, hey, I, you know, have this show that I've been starting. Um, the cast is still pretty small, but I would love you to join the, to join the cast. And a lot of the people that were in the cast are aerialists that I trained with, that I have taken privates with, that I have done private coaching from um, as a student. Um, so getting to perform alongside them was it was one of those experiences where I honestly couldn't take it in initially because mm -hmm. I was like, I don't feel like I'm on the same level as these people, but also assumed that if I was asked that they thought I was capable of that. So I started performing there about a year ago and I'll be honest and say that that was a tremendous confidence booster for me. And it really affirmed how much I loved performing. And then after that continued to just, look for other outlets and um yeah it's been it's been an uphill ride from there <laughs> well i would i would just 
um, add my perspective to your story on that, which I've seen it from, from the outside looking in, right? And I think you don't give yourself enough credit in the beginning by saying, you know, that these opportunities fall into your lap and that you're just sort of given them because I think you work really hard to put yourself out there for them. Um, you are, you take class so many times a week, you're probably in class more than anyone else that I've ever seen, whether, whether in your aerial class, I see you always going to aerial classes and kind of putting yourself out there, always going to ballet classes, putting yourself out there, always kind of having that energy. And I think that that sort of thing goes a long way and people notice it. People notice the dedication and the hard work and what, what you're putting out there into the world and want to kind of gravitate towards that and, and, and give you those opportunities. So I think uh, don't, don't sell yourself short with the amount of work that you've put in to show people that you're ready for these opportunities and that you're interested in these opportunities because these same opportunities didn't fall into my lap. They clearly only fall into the lap of people who were actually <laughs> looking for them and working for them. <laughs> so I would, I would just throw that in there. No, you are most definitely right. And um, it is true. Hard work and dedication is really what will help get you places. It's again, it's, we can, keep trying to get that pirouette and we'll just keep working at it until we get it. And, um, it's one of those, and I'll tell you that there were definitely many times where I was tempted to give up and thought I was never going to get a certain skill or thought I was never going to get a certain step. Um, and would go back to the days of, I started ballet too late. I started aerial too late and then got better perspective and was like, you've worked hard for several, several years, and it's paid off. And um, it's just been really neat to see the fruits um, of your labor in that way. And that really, you can do anything you put your mind to. It just takes hard work and dedication. And if you love something enough, it's almost just a fun journey. It becomes less of like a chore and more of like, I enjoy this. And even if it doesn't go anywhere, I'm still getting a bunch of joy out of it. And if it leads to other bigger opportunities, that's just a bonus. That's a, a very, I think, powerful outlook, especially coming from you who started late and has made so much of yourself in this world where you started um, later than people might think that you could do these things or even that you think that you could do these things. <laughs> you maybe started later than, um, than many people would have thought you could have these opportunities that you've made for yourself. So um, I think your, your story and your outlook is really um, inspiring for people who want to go after these things and want to make it happen. It, it, it really you have to show up and do the work, but when you show up and do the work, people do start to take notice and, and you, you build those connections, you build those relationships. And through all of that, you build yourself. It's really, really true. And um, it's, it's definitely changed my perspective, um, especially post-college and realizing that you don't always have to go the standard path that everyone tells you to go, um, that you can have, and this, and I'll turn it back over to you, I, I was so, when I first met you for coffee and learned that you started ballet around the time I did and that you had a dream about bringing ballet to adults, specifically to adults. And um, it's, it's probably a thing somewhere, somewhere else in the world, but it's not super common. And for you to have that vision and to go after that vision so young, and to have it take off in the way it did, and even though our physical doors are now closed, for it to still continue um, through Jess's new studio, through you online, me, Kristen, Jackie, and Chrissy, and Shanoa, all the other instructors, taking what we've learned from Brooch and taking it elsewhere. It's the huge creating Brooch Ballet has just rippled and is now actually going to so many other places than it could have gone had we just stayed in Denver. It's so true. The, the, the ripple effect of these things is huge. And I think one last kind of piece that I, that I want to point out from, from what you said earlier is, you know, that you're getting so much joy from the process and from the, and from what's happening in your, in your life and, and the journey throughout all of this. And I think sometimes we forget to, sometimes we forget that that joy has an impact on other people and it can feel selfish but when you talk about the joy that comes from making your dream come true, you don't know who that impacts in a positive way and how that actually goes out into the world. So the 
joy that we feel from a performance, from following our dreams, from, from working hard and, and building ourselves up actually does have an impact on the world. So I think that's something we forget and we, it's hard to take time for yourself because you think it's really selfish, but actually in, in a way it's the least selfish thing you can do and gives people hope, hope for the future. And if there's anything I've been learning, particularly over the last couple of months, is if you don't nurture your own soul and if you don't take care of yourself, then your well is going to be dry and you don't have anything to give out into the world. So whether that's taking a ballet class for yourself, whether that's doing a puzzle, whether that's going on a walk, whatever that looks like for anybody, um, to make sure that you give that to yourself. And then either share what you love with other people or use what nourishes you to then bring out positive change into the people and the lives around you. What a wonderful story, Casey. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I hope your story inspires so many of our listeners that they too can, can work hard, follow their dreams and make something super, super cool um, of their life. And uh, really just, even if they don't know what that passion looks like, they don't know how it manifests in the beginning, but they know it's there and they know it's real, just like you did when you were young. You knew it was there, but you didn't know what it meant. Just like that, I hope that even if they don't know exactly what it'll become, that they still start and follow and and just go for it with, with everything they've got. Julie, I can't thank you enough for having me on here and we'll always be grateful for the incredible influence that you and Brooch Ballet have had on my life. Thanks for listening today, dancers. For more adult ballet, you can follow our studio on Instagram and Facebook at Broche Ballet. You can follow me on Instagram at Julie the Ballerina or check out our blog and YouTube channels for more content. You can even dance with us in our online studio with daily live Zoom classes, private lessons, and our on-demand video library. Don't forget to have your story featured on our podcast. Email us at hello at brocheballet.com. I'm Julie Gill, and this was Broche Banter. Happy dancing!